My name is Lisa. I'm turning 27 this year. Ever since I was young, I was very shy and couldn't make the first move or approach someone I liked or was interested in. Even at this age, I've never had a boyfriend. People around me would tell me to hurry up and find someone, but I had no idea how to do that. I can easily talk to people I don't care about, but I'm completely tongue-tied with someone I'm slightly interested in. This is why I've never found a boyfriend at Mixers, through friends' introductions, or on dating apps. I had given up, thinking I wasn't capable of experiencing a normal romantic relationship or marriage. One morning, as usual, I was heading to work and bumped into a man who was running hurriedly in front of my office. My back fell to the ground and its contents spilled out. In my haste to pick things up, a man I bumped into also started helping, saying, I'm sorry. He was a handsome young man with slightly long hair, the kind who looked like a popular guy. Feeling embarrassed, I quickly gathered my things without saying a word and fled the scene. Hey, wait. I heard the man's voice behind me, but I didn't turn back. Later, while I was at work in the office, the section chief said, Okay, let me introduce everyone to the new employee. This is Charles, who will be working in the sales department starting today. The man standing next to the section chief greeted us. Nice to meet you all. It was the man I had bumped into in front of the company this morning. Wow, who is that guy? He's so handsome. The female employees were getting excited. I guess anyone would find him attractive. I couldn't believe he was joining our company. My heart was pounding. Charles noticed me and approached my desk. He then pulled out a tube of lip balm from his pocket, saying, This. You dropped it this morning. Sorry for bumping into you. I was in a hurry because I was going to be late. Blushing, I took the lip balm from him. Oh, thank you. That was all I could manage to say. I couldn't even see his eyes. Charles smiled gently and said, So, we work at the same company. Looking forward to working with you. Then he left. Feeling the intense gazes of the other female employees, I escaped to the bathroom. One day, when I was staying late at work, I noticed Charles was also working overtime. When I was finally done and about to head home. Lisa, are you heading home now? I just finished too. Would you like to walk together to the station? He invited. Charles invited me. I was absolutely thrilled. But out of embarrassment, I said I have something urgent to take care of, sorry, and immediately left. I'm such an idiot. I always miss these opportunities. Later, the company decided to hold a welcome party as several new people joined the company, including Charles. As expected, Charles was very popular and surrounded by female employees. I couldn't join in, so I sat a little away, drinking with my good friend Erica. But to my surprise, Charles came over and sat next to me. Hey, Lisa, having a drink? I was so surprised that I almost spit out my drink. Yes. I started to stiffen up and couldn't drink anymore. I had no idea what to talk about. Seeing my situation, Erica, with a concerned look on her face, threw me a lifeline. Charles, can you handle your liquor well? Me? Yeah, I can hold my drink. Oh, really? That's impressive. Erica was speaking for me, having a conversation with Charles. But I said, Erica, Charles, sorry, I just remembered something I have to do. I'm going home. I ran out of the bar. I'm such a failure. I thought this as I ran towards the station. Suddenly, from behind me, Lisa, wait up. Charles called, running after me. I tried to pretend I didn't hear him and kept going, but he caught up and grabbed my arm. Out of breath, Charles asked. Lisa, do you dislike me? I, I don't dislike you. Really? That's a relief. I felt like you were avoiding me. 
I just joined the company and don't have friends. Can we be close? Yes. Thanks. Can you give me your phone number then? And so, we exchanged numbers. Charles said he'd be going back to drink some more and return to the bar. I stood there in disbelief for a while. Was this a dream? I was a bit tipsy and stumbled my way home. From then on, I received messages from Charles every day. Through messages, I could communicate quite naturally. I felt like I was slowly getting closer to Charles. One day, I was invited to a movie date and hesitated. But Eric encouraged me and I thought this kind of opportunity might not come again in my life. Gathering my courage, I decided to take on the date. I was tense throughout, but managed to get through with Charles leading the way. After a few dates, Charles told me his feelings and we started dating. Are you sure you want to date someone like me? It's not someone like you. I want to be with you, Lisa. But Charles, you're popular. You could date someone prettier than me. For me, Lisa's the prettiest. Yell, I might be popular, but it's not something I really want. As long as I have Lisa, that's enough for me. I was really happy to hear him say that. I heard rumors that Charles was quite a ladies' man at his previous company. People around me warned me to be careful, but I wanted to believe in Charles. Without my asking, Charles sometimes showed me his phone to prove his trustworthiness. Charles told me he felt incredibly at ease when he was with me. Apparently, many of the girls he dated in the past were attracted to his looks and ended up becoming quite selfish. In summer, we would go to watch the fireworks, and in winter, we'd visit amusement parks during Christmas. We usually spent time at each other's homes and he would enjoy the meals I cooked. At this age, for the first time, I experienced what it was like to be a normal couple. Every day I spent with Charles was fresh and extremely happy. After a year of dating, Charles proposed me. Looking at the ring he had put on my left ring finger, I was so overjoyed I started to cry. It felt like a lie that I thought I could never get married a year ago. Next, I was told we were going to meet his parents. However, for some reason, I lost contact with Charles the day after the proposal. He was not coming to the office either. Worried, I asked a colleague and was told he was out due to illness. Could his condition be so bad he couldn't communicate? I went to his house, but despite ringing the doorbell many times, there was no answer. What on earth had happened? I even called Charles's mother, whom I had met a few times before, but it went to voicemail. After a while, I heard from Erica that Charles had resigned. That's not true, is it? Erica looked at me sympathetically. Well, it's true. I don't know the clear reason though. I wonder what happened. I hope he contacts you soon. I kept waiting for a message. We were engaged, he wouldn't just leave me. I thought something must have happened. A few months later, I received a letter. The sender was Charles, written neatly in his handwriting. To Lisa, I suppose you're probably worried about me by now. I'm really sorry. I'm in the hospital right now. I never had the chance to tell you, but I was actually sick. Bai was diagnosed with late-stage lung cancer not long after we started dating. I was told I had six months to live. I was shocked. Bai had plans to propose you someday, Lisa, and I was torn about whether or not to tell you about my illness. But I couldn't bring myself to say it. Hoping there might be a miracle, I proposed earlier than planned and decided to focus on my treatment. However, my condition worsened after the proposal to Lisa, and I was rushed to the hospital. It seems I could die at any moment now. Lisa, I won't be able to go see the theater performance you were looking forward to. So, I'm sending the tickets along with this letter. Lisa, you were the first person I truly fell in love with. I'm sorry that I couldn't make you happy. Thank you for everything. Charles. After that, I quickly contacted Charles' friends, found out which hospital he was in, and went straight there.
Although Charles had apparently asked them to keep it secret, they told me. Come to think of it, Charles had quit smoking about half a year ago. When I asked him why he suddenly quit, he said it was for his health. Why didn't I notice it then? He was losing weight, but I thought he was on a diet and didn't take it too seriously. When I got to his room, Charles' family was there. When Charles' mom saw me, she said, Lisa, I'm glad you came and started crying. Perhaps to give me some privacy, Charles' family quietly left the room. Charles had lost so much weight that he was unrecognizable. When I got closer, he said in a feeble voice, Lisa, thank you for coming. I wanted to ask him why he didn't tell me about his illness, but I just held Charles' hand and cried. Then Charles said, Lisa, I'm sorry. I didn't want you to see me like this, so I couldn't say anything. Don't apologize. You're not uncool at all, Charles. You should have told me. I'm sorry I didn't notice. It's okay that you didn't notice. I thought I'd die quietly, alone, like a cat. I even hesitated to send you the letter. I can't do anything for you anymore, Lisa, and I thought it might be better if I just disappeared quietly. But in the end, I really wanted to see you one last time. Life is ironic. Just when I finally found someone I truly wanted to cherish, this happens. Charles. I hugged Charles's thin body tightly while crying. Charles stroked my head with his frail hand. That night, Charles passed away quietly, with a peaceful look on his face, holding my hand. Charles was my first boyfriend in life. And he was my fiancé. The shock of losing Charles was so great that I took some time off from work and secluded myself. One day, Charles' mom contacted me and invited me to go see the play with her. I went to see the play that Charles and I were supposed to see together, with the tickets that Charles had sent, and his mother. The actor playing the lead role somewhat resembled Charles. The story of the play was about a main character who didn't know love, fell in love for the first time, and ended up proposing. It was just like us, I thought, and I started crying. Then, Charles' mom, who was sitting next to me, also started crying and held my hand. I squeezed her hand tightly in return. I'm sure she also felt like Charles was on the stage. Charles is never coming back, but he will live on in our hearts forever. How was cheerleading today? Well, I'd say 50 out of 100. We're getting there, but I messed up my backflip and wobbled during the lift. I hope we can make it to the national championship this year. Absolutely. We're going to win. Those were truly the happiest days of my life. We were close to qualifying for the cheerleading national championship, and we even got invited by a renowned university to join their joint practice sessions. My friends were always cheering me on. My dad, Bob, would wake up early to help me stretch and work out. My mother, Jessica, helped me a lot for my competition. It felt like everything was going perfectly. Then, it all changed in an instant. Watch out. Uh -huh. Bob and I were in a car when another vehicle slammed into us. It ran the red light and in the blink of an eye, our car was sent flying. I don't remember anything after that. When I regained my conscious in the hospital, I was stunned. It was pitch black. I couldn't see a thing. I touched my face with my hands, making sure my eyes were indeed open. Grasping the reason for the darkness, I let out a scream. It wasn't just a dark room at night. I had lost my sight. Then, I found out another heart-wrenching truth. My father had died in that accident. I had woken up two weeks post-accident. Bob's funeral had already taken place. The doctor explained that the reason I couldn't see was due to damage to the nerves in my brain. My brain had hemorrhaged from the crash, and I underwent emergency surgery upon arrival at the hospital. At one point, they told me my brain had swollen and I was in real danger. Thankfully, the swelling subsided, and the remaining blood clot was successfully removed. However, somewhere in that process, the nerves related to my vision got damaged, meaning I'd never regain my sight. Once those nerves are gone, 
they don't come back, at least, not with the current state of medical science. Despair was all I had left. If it was something hard work could fix, I'd give it my all. But being confronted with the reality of impossibility, all I could do was curse the cruel fate that suddenly befell me. May, how about a short walk? Being in the room all day must be boring. I don't want to. Why not? What's the point? Whether I'm out there or in here, nothing changes for me. All I have is darkness. It was just me lashing out. My mom had lost her husband and her daughter was now disabled. It wasn't like she wasn't hurting. I knew that, but I couldn't control my emotions. I later found out that apparently, people go through four stages when dealing with grief. The stage I was in when I snapped at my mom was the second one, the anger face. Why did this tragedy happen to me? Why did the car that ran the red light have to crash into dad's car? If it was just a second off, I would be. Why was my future taken from me? I kept imagining the unchangeable past, running simulations in my head where things could have been shifted by just a second. If only I had left the practice field a bit earlier. If I hadn't waved goodbye to my friends. If I hadn't stopped by the convenience store because I was thirsty. I knew it was pointless, but the images kept replaying in my head, and it left me in despair. No matter what I fought, dad wasn't coming back, and my vision will not come back. I pulled the covers over my head trying to escape from the harsh reality. But while I could snap at my mom, the strict nurses often pulled me out of my room. Ah, the breeze feels good. I love this early summer weather the most. I didn't engage with the nurse, just sat in my wheelchair, waiting for time to pause. I was wishing to be back in my room, but the breeze on my cheeks and the warmth of the sun did tickle my otherwise rigid heart. I couldn't see anything, but that didn't mean everything around me had vanished. Hey, can you tell what this is? The nurse placed something in my hand. It was some kind of leaf. Take a sniff. This is mint. Yes, volunteers have created herb garden for the hospital. Smells good, right? Lavender will bloom soon too. Upon hearing lavender, a vivid image of beautiful purple hues against a blue sky flashed in my mind. A gradient of the blue sky and purple land. A sight I would never see with my eyes again. Thinking about it, I felt a tightness around my stomach, but at the same time, I realized something for the first time. I can envision and see a scene if I've seen it before. If I had been blind from birth, would I miss out on such pleasures? From that day on, I started going out for walks, at first, in a wheelchair. After a while, I practiced walking with a cane in the hospital garden as part of my physical therapy, accompanied by my mother. Is the weather nice today? Yes, the sun is shining bright. I feel the warmth on my arm. Is the sun shining on it? It is. I thought so. I thought I wouldn't understand anything after losing my sight. In fact, I couldn't understand anything for the first week. I couldn't figure out the direction of the sounds I heard, the vibrations I felt, or what they meant. I never knew how terrifying it was not to be able to understand. But gradually, I began to understand sounds vibrations, scents, and temperatures. I realized I had a sort of radar for these things, and call it a sixth sense if you will. I didn't know by which sensation I was picking it up, but I could tell who was approaching me. Yes, I could call out their name before they even spoke to me. Oh, is that you, Nurse Catherine? How did you know? Can you see? I can't see, but I can tell. Yes, lately when I enter the room, May guesses who it is before I even speak. Sitting on a bench in the botanical garden, I took a deep breath, enjoying the fragrance of the surrounding herbs. Ah, it smells so good. I had no idea there was such a lovely botanical garden inside the hospital. Hey, I'm a bit thirsty. Want me to grab some juice? Can you wait here alone for a bit? I'm fine. My mother seemed anxious about leaving me alone outside but seeing me smile reassuringly, she quickly made her way to the store. Mom, be careful not to trip. It might have been since I first started elementary school that I needed such resolve to act on my own. The first time I walked home from school by myself, making sure not to get lost, I followed the path through the neighborhood as I was taught. Going back to those times, I have to train myself to act alone once again. Just as I was thinking that, I accidentally dropped my cane. I felt around the bench with my hand, but there was nothing to touch, and I couldn't find anything by feeling the ground with my feet either. Slowly, 
I stood up from the bench and crouched down, searching the ground with my hands. At that moment, unfamiliar footsteps stopped right beside me. Are you okay? Your white cane is about two inches to your right. Oh, thank you. The voice belonged to a young man. As he had told me, I reached out just a little more and felt the sturdy cane touch my fingertips. I gripped the cane firmly and slowly stood up. Want to sit on the bench? I need help getting there. Yes, please. Okay, I'm going to touch your left arm. All right. He gently placed his hand around my left wrist and slowly guided me. Take two steps backward. There you go. The bench is right behind you. I was guided by his hand to the seat and was sure I could sit down. I hesitated for a moment and then sighed in relief as I sat. Thank you so much. No problem. Did you lose your sight recently? Yes. I woke up blind after an accident. It's been about a month. I see. Must be hard getting used to it. The man, who introduced himself as Luke, told me his sister had just given birth in this hospital and he had come to visit his nephew. He also mentioned that he sometimes volunteered to maintain the botanical garden here. If you come to this garden again, we might run into each other. Yes, maybe. Then, I heard my mother's footsteps approaching. I was about to introduce Luke to my mother. But before I could, my mom spoke up. Excuse me, who are you? Did you do something to my daughter? My mom's tone was distant and suspicious. No, I'll be leaving now. Mom? Take care, May, and be careful not to drop your cane next time. With that, Luke walked away from me. Luke helped me when I dropped my cane. And you didn't even thank him. Oh? I thought he was hitting on you because he had a lot of piercings and looked like a pink. He wasn't. He was here to visit his sister who had just given birth. He also said he volunteers at this botanical garden. Oh, I see. Can't judge a book by its cover, huh? I shouldn't have jumped to conclusions. I was mad at my mom for her behavior. I couldn't believe she treated someone that helped me that way. But if I had seen him the way my mom described, I might have been scared too. If I could see, I definitely wouldn't have approached someone like him. Next time I see him, I need to thank him and apologize. I kept going for walks in the botanical garden. And whenever I met Luke, we talked about various things. How I used to do cheerleading. How I could do a backflip. Luke also shared that he's in a band, and recently, he's been thinking that working with plants might be a good idea. A month after my hospitalization, I was discharged, but I still went to the hospital for checkups and physical therapy. I joined the Botanical Gardens volunteer work every second Saturday when I knew Luke would be there. I mean, I couldn't really contribute much, but the volunteers were always happy to see me. Five months after the accident, I was getting ready for volunteer work again and waiting for my mom, who was coming down from upstairs to drive me. Mom? Let's go already. Urged by my voice, my mom descended the stairs, but I felt something was off about her footsteps and breathing. Mom? Are you feeling okay? I'm fine. We're going to volunteer, right? Yeah, but if you're not feeling well, you don't have to push yourself. I'm fine. You're looking forward to volunteering, right? Want to see Luke? I blushed a little at my mom's teasing tone. As always, she drove me to the hospital, but I noticed her breathing becoming more and more labored. I couldn't see it, but it sounded like she was starting to breathe heavily with her shoulders. As soon as the car parked at the hospital's parking lot, I realized my mom was leaning against the steering wheel, looking really unwell. Mom? Are you okay? Just need to rest for a bit. I'll be fine. Her voice didn't sound reassuring. Stay here, I'll go get help. I got out of the car and called out to anyone nearby. Is there anyone there? Please help. But I couldn't sense anyone around. I didn't even know where in the parking lot my mom had parked. What should I do? I started to panic, but I knew that Luke would be at the botanical garden. There would also be other volunteers there. So, with my white cane in hand, I started walking towards the garden. I stumbled over brick edges several times, bumped into metal railings and chains, and got disoriented and almost broke down in tears each time. I no longer knew where I was or how to get back to the car. Someone. Anyone. Please help. It was when I shouted that. May, what happened? Luke. Help. My mom. I shouted as I ran to Luke, clinging to him. 
Luke immediately scooped me up and ran to the parking lot. Once back at the car, he then carried my mom and rushed to the hospital. I could only sit beside the car, crying and waiting for Luke to come back. After a while, Luke returned and took me inside the hospital. Don't worry about your mom. The doctors are looking after her now. But it felt like she was in so much pain. It's all my fault for pushing her too hard. If something happens to her. It's okay. Don't worry too much. I'll be with you until the doctor comes. I held Luke's hand and waited in the hospital waiting room until we had news about my mom's condition. May, you've hurt your hand from the fall. I will train to walk better. In the future, I'll study Braille so I can help my mom with work. I need to do better. May, don't blame yourself so much. It's not your fault, May. If you blame yourself for your mom's condition, she'll blame herself for making you suffer. It's a vicious cycle. It's good to have a positive goal, but you should enjoy it too, right? After some time, a nurse called us. In the treatment room, my mom, who was getting four, was looking much better. It turned out she had experienced hyperventilation due to recent stress and fatigue. Luke, you helped us again, didn't you? Don't mention it. If I can be of assistance, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Well, maybe I should let you take care of May in the future. What? Mom? Suddenly, the world I was living in changed. I faced numerous challenges to adapt. I believe I'd give up if I was alone, but I have my mom, and Luke will help me too. I'll try even harder from now on. Take your time, honey. Yeah. Luke took my hand, and the three of us, me, mom, and Luke joined hands. I want to become someone who can help with these hands and be helped by these hands. I will do my best for that. I'm determined. Divorce? What are you saying? With tears glinting, my husband, Bob, is staring at me. We were sitting face to face, our hands placed on cold table. Suddenly you ask for a divorce, and do you think we can just say, okay, fine? Don't you know our relationship isn't that simple? No matter how much I blamed him, Bob kept his head down. 11 years of marriage. Why can he so easily let me go? We agreed to try infertility treatment one more time, didn't we? If we try again this month, and if we have a child, surely your feelings will change. Even mentioning our unborn child didn't change Bob's expression. In the room dominated by the ticking of the clock, I can't find a way to prevent this divorce. Have you always resented me? because we don't have children? Bob shook his head briefly, then nodded. Let me be honest. This is my penance to you. It's repentance. I've had feelings for another woman for a long time. At first, it wasn't serious. She was just friendly. But as I met her more. My vision blurs. What is he talking about? A plot from a recent TV show? Or something that happened to a friend? The more I met her, the more I was drawn to her. When I came home, you would blame me with the infertility treatments, saying this is good, that's good, serving tasteless food. I was suffocated by your obsessive beliefs. No, that's not, it's not about beliefs. I did everything internet said would help with conception. Everything for our child. Even the spoon, you changed to gold ones. Because the wooden ones absorb nutrients, and the plastic ones might have harmful residues. I watched a video of a woman who conceived by using that spoon. I'm fed up. What's the point? Clinging to unproven things. Bob stared at me with bloodshot eyes. Having a child is a miracle. Miracles don't happen by chance. You have to make preparations for miracles to happen. Then Bob let out a sigh. She's pregnant. When his words hit me, a sharp pain struck my lower abdomen. Eleven years. We spent tens. No, hundreds of thousands of dollars on treatments and products that were said to help with conception. Why won't a baby come into me? There was nothing wrong with both of our tests. We followed the doctor's advice, kept our bodies warm, and were mindful about our diet. I'm sorry, Sarah. I can't go back. Hate me. Bob said so and went back to his room. Right then, an email arrived. It was from the person who always gives me bread. She got pregnant after starting to eat that bread. How much do you want this time? Desperately, I replied. Bob asked for a divorce. I'm still considering whether to buy this month. Is it difficult to conceive if there's a break? I wanted her to say it wasn't, but my wish was in vain, and no reply came. Everyone was the same. Everyone disappeared when I mentioned the divorce. Months have passed since Bob left. 
Only loneliness remained. How lonely it is, going back and forth between work and an empty home. I put the remaining bread on a plate in place with the discounted deli food from the supermarket. Let's eat. I whispered softly and turned on the TV with the remote control. On the TV, an anchor was displayed, making a serious call to someone. So, the pregnancy germ thing is a hoax, right? Absolutely not. Some of the buyers indeed became pregnant. A voice blurred by a sound mosaic blowed. Is there scientific evidence? The call was cut off without a response. The program had a caption that read malicious fraud. The evil hands creeping into fertility quest, and I burst into laughter, tears overflowing from that moment. Lies, lies, they were all lies. I couldn't even wipe away the tears flowing incessantly. I just let them stream down, wanting to forget everything. I requested a transfer from the headquarters to a local grocery store. It was in the countryside, but since my parents lived there, I could also distract myself by meeting them. You're a good-natured person. It was unfortunate about Bob, but well, a tumultuous life is more fun. My mom laughed. I couldn't honestly talk about being immersed in cult-like farts, being scammed, or that my husband had an affair and got someone pregnant. I have a welcome party today, so I don't need dinner. Putting on my shoes, I told my mother standing behind me, Don't drink too much, she said, rubbing my shoulder. Having always been an office worker since graduating college, my body couldn't keep up with the jobs of supermarket. First, I was in charge of stocking and inspecting items to understand the situation. In the large supermarket, it was overwhelming just to remember where everything was located. No time to take notes. I rushed around making sure there were no stockouts. That's why beer after the work tasted especially good. Wow, but it's rare for someone to come all the way from the headquarters. Most people here can't even go to the headquarters. The assistant store manager brought his face closer, reeking of alcohol. And you're not wearing a ring, so you're single, huh? That's lonely. Oh yeah, we have one person who's falling behind. Hey, Matthew, come here. At the assistant store manager's beckoning, a man who had been sitting in the corner sat down in front of me. This is Matthew. He's really cute but seems a bit shy when it comes to love. Even when I introduce him like this, nothing develops. How about it, Sarah? Since you're both single, please get along. The assistant store manager slapped Matthew's back with a snicker. I sighed shortly, drained the beer in the assistant store manager's mug, and ordered Ulundi in exchange. Assistant store manager. You're too drunk. Switch to water for the next one. Sarah. I don't wanna. I still wanna drink. The assistant store manager wiggled with a creepy voice. Why do higher-ups of this generation easily do things resembling harassment? I've experienced enough of this sort of scene at the headquarters, and it was frustrating. No way. If you drink alcohol again, you'll be punished. Next is water. Understand? Being punished, that's scary. Yes. I'll listen to Sarah. He saluted cheerfully. After that, he talked to me in high spirits, as if he thought he had become a cat, so I nodded off appropriately to get through the situation. The next day, while I was entering stock data in the office, Matthew came in. Excuse me, are you busy right now? He came in timidly and stood in front of me. No, it's okay. I urged him to sit. I usually, I'm on the second floor, in the living goods section. Nah, so that's why he looked unfamiliar. I'm relatively new. So the assistant store manager found me to be a good toy, and you helped me yesterday, so thank you. He smiled as he said this. That was really cool, Sarah. Feeling embarrassed, I said, It's nothing. And turned my face back to the computer. I just hate that kind of thing. You're very straightforward. I'm so timid. My job hunting didn't go well. Oh, I don't like this. The topic has shifted. So. I really admired Sarah yesterday. I'm not straightforward at all. Recently, I even fell for a scam. Matthew muttered. A scam? Yes. And you know, I found out while watching TV during dinner. It's funny that I was being deceived. I laughed, and Matthew seemed uncomfortable. That's no laughing matter. It's okay, I. I just wanted someone to laugh with me. And suddenly, tears overflowed. Huh? That's strange. 
maybe something got in my eye. I said, trying to play it off, while holding a tissue to my eyes. Please don't push yourself. I'm here to listen as much as you need, said Matthew, offering me a handkerchief. After that, we started to hang out together often when we both had a day off. Your husband, he's not a nice man. It's all because he didn't listen to you properly. Isn't that why you fell for the scam? Hmm, well, I couldn't do anything even if I opened up about my troubles to him. I lost to my weaknesses. Then, Matthew looked at me with serious eyes. Sarah, you always put on a brave face. If it were me, I wouldn't make you sad like your husband did. He took my hand which was on the table. It was so sudden, I pulled my hand back immediately. I can still feel where he held it. Matthew, weren't you shy kind of guy? I asked, my face turning red, but Matthew's face was also turning red up to his ears. Is it wrong to appeal like this to a woman I want to protect? What are you doing? I... I'm a divorcee, you know? And it hasn't been long since I separated with my husband. Then how long should I wait? He said, bringing his face closer to mine. How long do I need to wait? How long? His eyelashes, when seen up close, were very long, and his clear eyes stole my heart. Besides, you should go for a younger, beautiful girl who isn't a divorcee, not an old divorcee like me. Matthew slowly shook his head. That day when you helped me, Sarah, I thought I had finally met my destiny. You're such a naive boy. There are plenty of women in the world, don't rush. I answered from my experience. It's too early for a guy Matthew's age to get married and being with me. That's just a waste of time. I want Matthew to be happy with the right person. So Sarah doesn't need to be happy. I have decided to live for my work. That's why I even requested to work in the town where my parents live. I am sure to take care of my parents in their old age. Can I not be in that future? His relentless serious gaze had me flustered. Let me think a bit more, okay? I felt like I might agree if he pushed any more. I have thought enough. He took my hand again and came closer. Tell me clearly, do you hate me, Sarah? For a moment, the face of the assistant manager crossed my mind. Matthew, who seemed shy due to the alcohol, was entirely different. Moreover, I am being aggressively approached by him now. In the end, people just see the surface and solidify their imaginations. I don't particularly hate you. I said, unable to meet his eyes any longer. So, do you like me? Facing such a blunt choice, I forget I am a divorcee and feel nervous like a girl being confessed to by her first love. I want to be happy with you, Sarah. I will probably continue to lose and be swayed by Matthew. Unlike my ex-husband, he was good at talking while looking into the eyes. I, who am not used to it, cannot keep eye contact for long. But he always tries to look into the emotions hidden deep within my heart. No matter how much I avoid, he takes the initiative to capture me. A divorcee and a younger man. It seemed our love had already begun blooming a long time ago. I'm Sherry. I gave birth at 17 and now have a 10-year-old daughter. I divorced seven years ago due to domestic violence from my husband, leading to PTSD. Since the divorce, I worked full-time at a company, but PTSD worsened, so I left the company and have been living with my parents for the past year. With my symptoms easing due to treatment, I was looking to start working again. I vigorously looked for a job and got an interview at a small company. The company sells educational materials for elementary and middle schoolers, a stepping stone for me who wants to support children someday. However, I dropped out of high school. I previously worked part-time for three years, became a contract employee, and then got promoted to a full-time position. I applied for a part-time position again this time. Then came the day of interview. I was led to the reception room and interviewed by the CEO herself. My name is Sherry. Nervously, I looked at the female CEO sitting in front of me. The CEO observed me from head to toe, then turned her eyes to my resume. I could see her eyebrows furrow as she read my resume. So you dropped out of high school? I saw that coming. Yes. I gave birth at 17 and have been working since. I see. A high school dropout and a single mother. Her words, seemingly mixed with size, pinched my heart. But I am motivated. I think I can handle general administrative tasks. I conveyed my sincerity, albeit fearfully. The CEO then placed my resume on the table and looked at me condescendingly. The day ended with an uncomfortable vibe. 
I didn't feel confident at all. I was sure I would be rejected. Moreover, I felt a bit scared. Her domineering demeanor reminded me of my ex-husband. I came home with my heart racing. It might be okay not to get the job. The racing settled when I thought like that. Contrarily, I was genuinely surprised when I received a call saying I got the job. However, I was happy and decided to do my best with renewed vigor. At work, I was assigned administrative and miscellaneous tasks. There was a gap, but having done administrative work for a long time, it didn't take long to recall. The other employees were kind, and the atmosphere was better than I expected. However, the CEO continued her harsh and domineering approach to me. I also see her chatting and laughing with the other employees, seemingly getting along well with them. I wondered, why did she hire me? I was filled with strange feelings. Every day, going home, my heart raced again. Two months since I have started working, my heart races three times a week, especially on days after interactions with the CEO. I knew this wasn't good. Everyone in the company was nice, especially the CEO's son, Andy, who was concerned about me. I'm sorry for my mom's harsh words to you. I think she doesn't mean harm, but it's too much. Andy spoke to me one day after work. It's okay. It's true I don't have much education. Seeing me smile wryly, Andy said, If Day's anything, tell me. I'll convey it to her. Andy is the same age as me and the company's heir. I guess he feels responsible to convey things to his mom, the CEO. Then, one day, a valued customer visited, and I prepared tea. I notice my slight nervousness as I knock. When this door opens, the CEO will be there. I take a deep breath, trying to regain my composure. Excuse me. I lock eyes with the CEO as I open the door. A flutter in my heart, but I maintain a calm facade as I serve tea to the guest. But then, Ouch. I am so sorry. My hands are shaking, and I spill the piping hot tea on the table next to where the guest is sitting. What are you doing? Quickly, bring some ice. It's all right, it's just a splash. The guest reassures me with a smile, but the sea urges me to bring ice quickly. As I ran to get the ice, almost in tears, I realized my heart was racing. That day, after the guest left, I was called by the CEO and was loudly scolded. I knew I shouldn't have hired someone with such a low education level. He's our valued client. Her words pierced through my heart. I'm very sorry. It was a mistake at work, but as she spoke, frustration and fear mixed and tears welled up in my eyes. What are you crying for? This is all part of the job, don't you understand? I start to tremble at the CEO's attitude. I'm scared, so scared, what do I do? I see flashes of my divorced husband's face. I freeze, tears rolling down my cheeks. You're crying, tears won't excuse you in the workplace. His harsh words felt like a kick. I, I can't breathe. I began to hyperventilate, and it was then that the CEO noticed something was wrong. Come on, CEO, you've gone too far. This is just like her assing Sherry. Andy rushes to my side and intervenes. Sherry, do you want to rest in another room? Seeing my hyperventilating state, Andy immediately separates me and the CEO. He takes me to another room, and I wait until my breathing recovered. I thought there's no point in continuing this job after enduring so much. The experiences of my past and the CEO's attitude linked together in my mind. Maybe it was too soon. Feeling lost, I decided to quit the company. I conveyed my decision to resign due to health issues over the phone and left the company. Though it happened suddenly, Andy, who knew the whole story, did not blame me for it. As for the uniform, if it's uncomfortable for you to come to the company, shall we meet outside to hand it over? Andy suggested this over the phone. So we decided to exchange the uniform later outside. When handing over the uniform, Andy apologized deeply. Sherry, I'm really sorry. My mother, it's my responsibility to that I didn't stop the CEO earlier, knowing she would react like this. Seeing Andy apologize, I regret my own weakness. No, it's not your fault, Andy. Would you like to talk a bit? Invited by Andy, we sat down on a bench in a nearby park. My mother, like you, raised me all by herself. She's a single mom, and she also dropped out of high school. Really? I lift my face, a little surprised by Andy's words. Yes, she seems to have an inferiority complex about her education level. My parents divorced when I was three. Since then, I saw her crying every day after coming back from various jobs. Hearing those words, I remembered my daughter. 
Recently, she had been worried about me coming back from the company without energy. Remembering that, my chest tightened. Being a single mother with no education, she seems to have had a lot of rough times. But she used those experiences as a stepping stone to start her own company. However, maybe because she wasn't treated well by her colleagues when she was an employee, especially since your situation resembles her past, maybe she saw herself in you. Listening to Andy's words, I nodded slowly. She must have been through a lot, but I honestly get scared by loud voices and intimidating attitudes too. Upon expressing those fearsome words, Andy nodded vehemently. It's okay, that's normal. Feeling a sense of relief seeing Andy say that with a smile, I opened up. Actually, I, I've experienced violence from my ex-husband. Stories of my past were coming out of my mouth. Andy listened to my story attentively, looking at me with serious eyes. Oh, I'm sorry. My story is irrelevant, isn't it? I didn't intend to share my life story, and I blushed. Thank you for sharing. I believe there are better workplaces out there. I'm the successor of that company, so I've decided to be more proactive in conveying various things to the president. Saying that, Andy apologized again. Thank you for today. I thanked Andy, and we parted ways. Watching Andy's back getting distant, I felt oddly lonely. I probably won't see him again. After quitting my job, I attended counseling for a while to mend my body and soul. But I was also frustrated with my indecisiveness. It really did hurt to be spoken to that way because of my lack of education. The bitterness motivated me. Even the CEO said she was able to build up the company with her resentment as a springboard. I can do something too. I'll get my GED. Thinking that, I started studying for my GED from that day. I asked a nearby tutoring center to teach me, and I earned the tuition by working part-time at a convenience store in the early mornings. The store wasn't very crowded, and the manager was reticent, so I didn't feel intimidated like before. Now, having a goal gave meaning to my work. Ten years have passed since then. My daughter has grown up well and is now employed. I work as a support staff at an after-school program. When I was working to earn that high school diploma certification, I studied alongside my daughter. I even attended a social work college and finally fulfilled my dream of supporting children. I finally found my worth in spending my days with the children. Then one day, while I was alone in the office, Excuse me. A man knocked on the door. Thinking it was a salesperson, I opened the door to see a man standing with a large bag and a smile. I almost lost my breath at that moment. Oh, I unintentionally let out a voice, and the man looked puzzled, but in the next moment, he seemed to remember something. Could it be? He also looked at me in surprise. Are you Andy? You are Andy, aren't you? I noticed the excitement in my voice. Sherry, I knew it. You remembered. Of course, I remember. Have you been well? We naturally smiled and rejoiced at our reunion. Would you like some tea inside? I said to Andy, inviting her in. He was in the middle of selling learning materials for elementary schoolers. I made tea and brought it to Andy. Thank you. I never thought we'd meet again like this. Drinking the tea I made, Andy said that. Have you been doing the same job and did you take over? When I asked, Andy's face clouded over for a moment. Afterward, he told me everything that had happened over the past 10 years. It seems the company ran into severe financial difficulties shortly after I left the company. Perhaps because of that, the president's behavior toward the employees worsened, and the number of employees drastically decreased. Around the same time, it seems the president suffered a stroke. Even out, her lower body is paralyzed, and she is residing in a facility. I was at a loss for words when I heard this. My mom regrets her attitude when she was the president. She feels firsthand that she ruined the company. She cries every day, saying it's too late to regret now. Occasionally, she mentions your name, Sherry, saying she didn't know how to be kind and ended up hurting you. I felt indescribable upon hearing these words from Andy and looked down. At that time, I was frustrated, but I used that frustration to get my high school diploma and managed to go to a school for social work. As I said in a soft voice, Andy looked at me with kind eyes. You are a resilient person. I didn't stop you when you said you were leaving because I wanted you to move forward believing in your strength. I felt a bit happy at Indy's words. But honestly, I wanted to stop you. I think if I had been more firm, things might have been different. Hearing Annie's muttered words, I felt suddenly embarrassed and looked away. That day, 
I exchanged contact information with Andy. We became friends who occasionally email or call each other, updating one another on our lives and offering words of encouragement. It's been 10 years since I left the company. However, I was aware that his presence within me had grown. One day, would you be willing to meet with my mom? I was honestly not sure when Andy asked me this. I was worried the fear might come back, and there was a part of me that somehow still couldn't forgive her. But she is also the person who made me who I am now. If it wasn't for her, I might not be where I am today, and I might have been stuck, compromising and maintaining the status quo. I understand. I'll meet her. I said, conveying my decision to meet the former president. Then, led by Annie, I went to the facility where she resides. I was nervous, but strangely not afraid, as Andy was with me. We were waiting for her in the visitor's room when a knock was heard and the door opened quietly. There she was, sitting in a wheelchair, looking a bit sad. It's been a while. Thank you for coming. The president bowed her head while still in the wheelchair and suddenly started sobbing. Are you okay? I hurriedly asked, and she nodded while crying and apologized me many times. And then, I didn't think you'd come. I am really sorry for what I did. I don't know what to say. I have done something truly unforgivable to you. I rushed to her and handed her my handkerchief. It's okay. Well, I was honestly scared and hurt at that time. But I could turn the regret into my drive because of what you said. Hearing my words, she cried even more. She told me that she saw herself in me, being a single mother without education when she was young and I shared that I had PTSD due to domestic violence from my ex-husband, and my mental health was deteriorated. I thought that if it wasn't for Andy, I might have done something much worse to you. I've been thinking I needed to apologize. It's not something forgivable, though. At her words, I shook my head. I was glad that I could honestly convey my fear and pain. The president and I reconciled after 10 years. Thank you for today. On the way back, Andy thanked me. No, I'm glad I met her. The lump in my chest is finally gone. Smiling, I was about to wave at Andy when There's something I've wanted to say for a long time. I could feel my pulse quicken at his words. I never forgot about you, Sherry, in these 10 years. I liked you since we were working together. If something happens, I want to protect you this time. Will you go out with me? My heart was pounding so hard, it felt like it was going to jump out of my mouth. Too embarrassed to let him see my blushing face, I looked sideways and answered, I liked you too. Please take care of me. With the autumn breeze, the gentle sound of insects came into my ears. 